proponents of fracking are about to lose a talking point. It's time to go digging for value. Hi, I'm Allison Southwick, and I'm joined today by Taylor Muckerman and Joel South, energy analysts here at The Motley Fool. Let's get to our top story. Right. We're heading over to Reuters, where they are reporting on how Apache is taking a big step forward when it comes to the reliance on fresh water in the fracking process. As the article points out, one well can use millions of gallons of water, and in a place like the Permian, there's just not a lot of fresh water to be had. So. Taylor, can you talk a bit about what Apache is doing to solve this problem? So basically when you're drilling uh, fracking wells, you're talking about two types of water that is coming back out of the ground during the drilling process. You have the uh, fracking fluid, the flow back coming back out of the ground after you pump it in. And then once the well is producing, you have produced water that's naturally been stored down there with the hydrocarbons coming back up. And we're talking about millions and millions of barrels, like you mentioned. Uh, so basically, a lot of the fracking fluid is trucked in. You're talking about 1,200 trucks, possibly, per well. And so essentially, what we're doing is taking a lot of the transportation infrastructure out of the picture, saving a lot of money here. And they're the first company to do it with 100% recycled water. So is, how big of a deal is it that they've actually that they've taken this big step forward? I think it's a huge deal, not only because Apache is a huge name in the business, so they're leading by example, but now they're finally showing that it's uh, financially feasible and in an area like the Permian Basin uh, that was left for dead before fracking, and now it's really booming and expected to be one of the largest plays in the world. Um, it, if activists have really clamped down on the fact that so much fresh water has been needed. So you look at a company like Halliburton and their H204 word suite of uh, products that you can now basically have a, a, a mobile water recycling unit and uh, basically like like they're doing here, 100% of their water is recycled. Um, you're talking about 29 cents a barrel for this recycling process versus uh, $2.50 in this area for the transportation of the, of the wastewater. So saving a lot of money here. And if other companies take the same route that they are, I think it could be a nice boon for the industry, especially in the more dry climates like you have down in Texas. And like we said, also taking a talking point away from people exactly. who are opposed yeah. to fracking. You talk about in Colorado, people mention it's much more visible. So agriculture uses way more water, way more water than fracking does, mm -hmm. but they're, re they're pulling that water from rivers and streams near their farms, so it's not quite as visible. Well, what they're doing with these transportation trucks is a lot of times going to local fire hydrants and pulling this water out into these huge tractor trailer trucks. And so uh, citizens are much more aware of what's going on here, and so that's why it's come under fire a lot more than wastewater in the farming industry. All right, let's head over to Platts for our next story. They are talking about how big oil has been cashing in on high oil prices through divestment of non-core assets rather than through actual increased output. But now that strategy is changing. So Joel, can you talk a little bit about what the strategy has been with the whole divestment? Yeah, definitely. Basically what you're seeing is you're seeing high oil prices right now. So if you have oil assets that you're not ready to drill right now, you can go out and sell them. You know, a lot of big oil companies, they go after those bigger plays where they can start drilling, uh, leave them online, and get a lot of oil for over a number of years, where a lot of the Shell plays, uh, you know, you drill and they deplete a lot faster. So you're seeing companies like Shell recently in the, in, in the Eagle Ford selling these assets because right now, since the oil prices are high, they're getting top dollar. So they're really growing a lot of their margins. They're, um, instead of growing the production, they're selling those assets, and that's really where they're getting a lot of their uh, in net income. Right, and so the focus going forward, as this article points out, is mm -hmm. that they're going to focus now on organic growth. So what are some of the struggles that they're going to face here? Well, it's going to be hard to grow organically because uh, finding new oil plays are getting harder and harder. So what you're seeing now with a lot of big oil is you, they're getting out there, starting to drill, but they're not getting the production uh, with the liquid side. You're seeing companies like Exxon, BP, Total, over the last few years have been declining their liquids. So what you're, what you're seeing them, they're going and in, in increasing the production, but it's natural gas. It's not the same. So what, how they're getting investors right now is they're offering a lot of dividend increases and share buybacks. ExxonMobil over the past five years has um, returned over $100 billion to shareholders. And that's kind of where they're keeping them right now. But if you don't see these production growths or, uh, continue to go forward, uh, you're going to see people uh, discount big oil like they're starting to do. Uh, Warren Buffett, not one of them. Yeah. Uh, he's <laughs> looking more long term. But right now, you're seeing a lot of people discounting big oil for the same reason. 
All right, let's move on to our next headline over at Natural Gas Intelligence. They are reporting that BP is going to announce their decision on whether or not to move forward in Utica at the beginning of 2014, so a couple months away potentially. Mm -hmm. um, right now they're leasing about 105 acres in Northeast Ohio. Uh, this was considered a pretty bold move back when BP first started sniffing around back in 2012. So what's the speculation like here? If I were a betting woman, would I bet that they're going to move forward in Utica or, or get out? Well, you know, you have two different ways to look at this. Uh, they've got acreage kind of right in the middle of the eastern side of Ohio, leaning a little bit to the north, but you've seen mixed results on the other on either side of them. So to the north, Halcone had a few dry wells in northeast Ohio recently. They've had great success elsewhere, but in the northeast counties of Ohio, they did come up with a few dry wells, which really disappointed investors, um, but they have other acreage that they can concentrate on there. But then south of them, you look at Chesapeake uh, doing really great things in the oily, more oily regions of the United which is connected to the Marcellus in uh, eastern Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. So great potential here. And since they're right in the middle, I think that they've got, you know, with 105,000 acres, there's going to be some high producing wells here, I think. So my bet is that they'll move forward with this. But because this region has been up in the air so much, I think that uh, it's what investors are focusing on a lot, especially because they're an integrated oil company. So they really have a lot of clout if they decide to stick around. So you talked about Halcone and Chesapeake also mm -hmm. being in the area. Are right. there any other players in the area, or is it really the three of them right now? Well, one company that's certainly hoping that BP sees success is Mark West Energy. Energy. They're an infrastructure player. Uh, they have largest here in the Utica. They're basically looking to build out up to 450% more processing uh, capacity with projects either under construction now or under consideration. And then they've also got some fractionators and some pipe, uh, natural gas liquids pipelines that are under construction as well. So um, if BP dries up and moves out, some of these plans that they have could be off or not. All right. In our last headline today, we're going to head over to the AP, who is talking about Devon Energy. They are buying up some Eagle Ford assets from Geo Southern Energy to the tune of six billion dollars. Joel, can you kind of fill us in on what the details are of this? Sure. I mean, Eagle Ford assets are always great. However, they're expensive, and Devon paid a lot of money for mm -hmm. these. A uh, couple good things that you really want to focus on is where did they get the assets? And if you look at it, it's in the Dewitt, in the uh, Lovkava. Uh, place or uh, counties and those are two of the very uh, highest oil concentrated plays and if you look at it on a WTI uh, basis the break even price in those plays is about 19 or in those counties is about $19 and $49 respectively so obviously at today's prices well over $95 uh, this is very profitable and you know uh, if you also look at what, how they're going to finance this. This is a company that sold off a lot of assets internationally. They've had a great balance sheet, a lot of cash on hand for a long, a long time, so they're starting to finally use that and moving away from the natural gas. So, you know, I think this is a pretty good move overall. Um, 2015 EBITDA, it's about 2.5 uh, times EBITDA. So, you know, they'll be making their money back in the very short term on it. All right. Well, let's move away from the headlines and move to the mailbag where we answer your questions. If you have a question for us, you can send it to us on Twitter. We're at TMF Energy. For our first question, we've got Lawrence Smith with the Twitter account of BS LaFont. He wants to know, is EOG too richly valued? Um, I'll go ahead and start off with my opinion. I think it's not. I own this company in our real money portfolio for The Motley Fool. It was one of my first editions, um, and that was just a few months ago. So it's seen a little bit of a pullback since then. I think it's down a couple percent for me, but I still believe in this company long term. Uh, you talk about a company with a visionary CEO and Mark Papa, um, probably leaving pretty soon, but he's been able to take this company in the right direction. Uh, moved away from natural gas early in the 2000s, believing that prices would drop, which they did. He also instituted rail transportation from all their major basins, which means that they get a high price, generally the Louisiana light sweet crude price that they get down there in the Gulf of Mexico. So he's done a few things here for this company that have really held high returns on, on capital employed and also the production that we're seeing, uh, which I think you know is leading all of its peers. And then uh, they're much more diversified than some of their oily uh, independents that you see, such as Continental Resources, led by Harold Hamm up in the Bakken, along with Kodiak Oil and Gas. And what EOG has done is kind of set a blueprint for companies like that to really expand, drive down well costs, and uh, they've been able to really follow along pretty strongly. No, I definitely agree. I mean, this is one of the companies 
company is one of the independents that's really uh, done everything right. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you look at them on a metrics basis, they do look expensive. You know, price to book, they're significantly higher than a lot of their peers. And then on the enterprise value by EBITDAX, they're also a lot higher than their peers. Mm -hmm. But like you mentioned, the pe people aren't really accounting for how much growth they have the amount of oil that they're actually getting, you're seeing a lot of their uh, initial productions soaring over the past years, yep. in the, and on top of the 38% compound annual growth rate that they had for the past six years, right. they're expecting 30 plus through 2017. So you know, there's so much growth here. Um, the management's been great, great assets. So you know, they do have some pretty rich uh, valuations, but you know, I think it's well worth it. Yeah, I agree. All right, let's head over to our next question. Then it comes to us from B Steph 12. He wants to know what do we make of clean energy and Solar City because these are some pretty volatile stocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. He's right, definitely right about one thing, and that's that they're volatile, um, mostly because they're young and they're trying to venture out into new industries, clean energy fuels, natural gas, transportation, um, the pioneering here with their America's Natural Gas Highway led by a visionary, T. Boone Pickens, um, had his hand in the oil and gas industry for uh, as long as I've ever known about the, the industry and even way before that, moving from industry into oil and gas hedge fund down in Texas. So he's got a lot of money, a lot of political clout, and he's been behind this company since its very beginning. And then Solar City, uh, doing solar leasing for homes, residential and business as well. Um, very successful getting into the market Im immediately. They have had to rely on government subsidies and still do, but I think with their horizon that they look forward to with their regenerative cash flows based on their leasing model, I think that the company has a strong future as long as solar itself continues on and gains more traction excuse me, more traction uh, around the United States and worldwide. If the industry does successful things, I think Solar City will follow suit. But if there's a pullback at all and we start to rely more on natural gas or coal for our energy uh, solutions, then I think Solar City. But I don't think it's going to falter on its own. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you look at uh, the, a lot of the uncertainty uh, going forward is really causing a lot of that volatility. So, you know, you just got to figure out where the industry is going. And like you mentioned, Solar City has a great future. And if you look at the prices for photovoltaic uh, systems, they've been cut in half since 2010. So the costs for the energy costs are really being on par uh, at parity to a lot of the other fuels, and you'll continue to see that going as efficiency keeps kicking in. And a company like Solar City, they're competing on cost, which is nice. They use a, a, a lot of the Chinese manufacturers uh, for their models or for their uh, systems, and these are pretty efficient uh, systems. They're improving there, but they are cheaper. A company like SunPower has that more uh, efficient model, but they're charging more money. Yep. So you know, I think Solar City is in a great position going forward. Uh, they want to get to that one million customer mark by 2018. You know, if they hit that, uh, that's basically over 70% uh, compound annual growth rate. So investors w should be re well rewarded. Um, with clean energy fuels, you know, this is another company. Will it really catch on? And I think it will. It's going to start on the commercial side. They've done a lot of great things this past year, putting deals together, even recently with mm -hmm. UPS. So if they can really build out that commercial side, get that transportation or get that highway system uh, continued to be built out, I think it will catch on. That's one of the you know long-term plays. But if it does, um, natural gas stays cheap and it looks like it's going to for a long term, uh, this company could really benefit from that. Yeah, and Joel mentioned UPS. I think we might have an image here with some of the other uh, companies that they're working with, including GE and Westport and Cummins. So you're looking at a lot of, not just government backing mm -hmm. for clean energy fuels, but also some of the biggest companies in the world believe strongly in clean energy fuels. And it's obvious by the amount of money and time that they're backing this company with. Yeah, and you know a lot of big oil companies that are drilling for the natural gas, they're also going to throw their money behind this. So there's a lot of money, a lot of effort going behind this, this, uh, this development. So we'll see how it goes going forward. You might have just talked me into buying this company later. I don't know, as soon right. as I can. <laughs> well, you'll disclose it. I will. Yeah, you will. Because yeah, um, that's how we roll at The Motley Fool. All right, if you have a question for our analysts, go ahead and send us a tweet or tweet at us or whatever the verb is on Twitter. I don't know. We're Something at, like that. We're at TMF Energy. TMF Energy. That's it. Yeah. That, that's all you, that's need, all to you need to know. That's all you need to know. At TMF Energy. And if you also are looking for more energy analysis and research, you want to check out our report, Three Stocks for the Next oil boom or energy boom in America, send an email to oilboom <laughs> at fool.com. Until next time, I'm Allison Southwick. For Taylor and Joel, thanks for watching.